In the name of the one whose name is peace, I welcome you this morning. Good morning, everyone. A warm welcome to those who might be visiting with us. We certainly uh, welcome you, and we want to assure you that we are very pleased that you're with us and that our hope is that you feel very much a part of our celebration this day on Remembrance Sunday. To those who are sharing with us through our, our um, East Link television, we certainly welcome you as well. And uh, again, uh, we hope that you feel very much a part of our celebration this day. After our worship service, there's a gathering down in the gymnasium to which you're all invited. Uh, and uh, I understand it's a special day because it's someone's birthday and there's cake and all this sort of stuff. So <laughs> I'll not point any fingers. <laughs> so uh, please come down and share in some cake. And uh, he's 50 years old. Oh, what is this? <laughs> <laughs> but it's only a number, right? Uh, I'm not John Moses. You've probably already identified that. Uh, John had to be called away for a presbytery meeting, uh, um, an emergency. So he's not here with us this morning. So he's about some other work in the presbytery, so he'll be back next week. A welcome to Catherine Dewar, who's seated here. Catherine uh, was the, wrote the book, The Splendid Girls, and Catherine, uh, the book is about the First World War uh, nursing sisters on Prince Edward Island, so it's, uh, it's a really um, a book that needed to be written to recognize the women, and in particular the nurses, that gave so much during the, uh, in particular, the, the First World War. So Catherine, a little later on, is going to be sharing with us uh, her um, a talk with us regarding that. So we look forward to having uh, Catherine with us. And uh, certainly, as I've said, it's a, a gr really a groundbreaking um, writing book that really uh, gives some light on the wonderful uh, work and dedication of the women uh, during the First World War. Also, you've already experienced some of the wonderful, delicious music that's been filtering through those wonderful pipes, would you call them, or whatever. Yeah, so anyway, and I'm not talking about the pipe organ. I'm, I'm thinking about uh, Dan St. Man and uh, Laura McLeod, and there's Henry Oxford, and uh, Orford, sorry, and Margaret Orford at the end. So welcome to you folks, and we certainly are. <laughs> we certainly appreciate the gifts that you share with us in the music that you give, not only here, but I know in the other areas of your life. So thank you for sharing with us this morning. We really appreciate it. Thank you. Oh. Yes, I've already said this. Don is celebrating his 50th birthday on November 7th, and you're invited to come down for some cake and talk to him. <laughs> David Rogers will be 80 years old on November 10th. So that's a, a real great age, and uh, David hasn't changed much from his baby pictures. He still looks pretty much the same, but a little bigger. Branson uh, is turning 12 years old on November 14th, and he looks like he's having a good old time and enjoying these years. A letter to the congregation. A letter was sent out, and you know, with the postal costs skyrocketing, that sort of stuff, we're really trying to cut costs. So when you came in, there was a whole lot of, um, there was a, uh, a box of letters out there. If you didn't get one, please, take one. It saves us on a lot of postage. And uh, if you know of someone, uh, a neighbor or anything that's not here, uh, would you just take them and deliver them to them? And that would just really alleviate a lot of sending stuff out. There we go. And Linda Dunning is going to have a few words regarding, is it the, some type of fair or something? Good morning. This is it. We can see the light at the end of the tunnel. And it really is the star at the top of the Christmas tree and not the train coming towards us. The fair is ready for setup. The jams, the jellies, the pickles are ready. 
for display. The crafts are crafted. The knitting and sewing can be displayed. The silent auction will not be silent any longer. And the baking fudge and deli will soon be full to overflowing. Let's not forget the jewelry. There are baubles and earrings, there are baubles and earrings galore. Right across are the treasures. Let's look at some and choose. Finally, the books. Who doesn't like a good book? And just for all you grandma and grandpas, there's lots and lots of children's books this year. So come pick some and spend an afternoon reading to your grandchildren. So there it is, a trip around our Christmas Fair 2014. All that is left is to welcome our guests next Friday and Saturday. What's left for us is to bring in your fresh baking and fudge on Thursday. Come volunteer. We'll find a spot for you. Bring a friend or two for lunch. But most of all, have fun. See your friends, buy something, and share all the memories this fair celebrates. So I'll see you Friday, November the 11th from 10 to 4, Saturday, November the 15th, 9.30 to 2. That's just four days, 96 hours, 5,760 minutes, 345,600 seconds. So let's make every second count. <laughs> See you soon. Also on November 23rd at 1030, uh, our worship, it's our anniversary service, 150th anniversary service. And our speaker is Reverend Dr. Anthony Bailey from Be Parkdale United Church in Ottawa. So this is uh, 150 years is a fairly significant length of time to be uh, a presence in Charlottetown. So come on out and enjoy uh, Anthony Bailey as he shares with us and certainly the worship service on that day. Also noted is the, and the same day at 7 o'clock, there's a musical celebration 150. Uh, so there, we have a, a lineup for that as well, and there's going to be a celebration. Uh, Joey Kitson is going to be uh, uh, there, and Sylvia Much, Suzanne Campbell, and Don Fraser Trio, I think. Yeah. <laughs> so, uh, so anyway, there's going to be, uh, uh, that'll be a fun time and uh, a great uh, uh, amount of good music and fun together. I would ask, uh, as we sing this, uh, this psalm together, that those who are participating in worship, in the call to worship, come forward and take a place, uh, a seat at this time. Um, and I want to thank all those who are uh, participating in the liturgy during this morning. So thank you very much to those persons. Let us join together in singing Psalm 90, O God, our help in ages past.
Once there was a person who said such wonderful things and did such marvelous things that people began to follow him. And one day they asked, Who are you? And he answered them, I am the light. A call to remember. Remember Ypres, the Somme, Mons and Verdun. Remember the Western Front, El Alamein, Sicily, the Normandy invasion. Remember Dresden, Hong Kong, Hiroshima, the Burma Road, Remember Korea, Bosnia, Afghanistan. Remember the courage and the comradeship, the ingenu ingenuity, the spirit of working together for a common cause, and the planning together for a better world, for a world at peace. Remember the call to arms, the patriotic songs, the posters, the partings that were such sweet sorrow, the sound of the drum, the skirl of the pipes, the prayer that God would be on our side. Remember the carnage, the colossal stinking bloody horror, the shattered bodies on the wire, the platoons of which only three out of 40 survived. Remember the widows of 60 years or more, the old men and women living now who never knew their fathers. Remember the love that was lost, the wisdom wasted, the minds that were twisted and the limbs distorted. Remember the wealth of nations being fired from guns, dropped as bombs, smashing schools, homes, factories, churches, and hospitals. Remember the hope of a whole generation left to evaporate in the sands of a desert or sink forever beneath the oceans of the world. Remember this day, the children who will die while the world spreads, spends its wealth on arms, the child soldiers taught only to hate and kill, the armies of youth with no work and no future. Remember the one who refused to take up the sword, who said those who live by the sword shall perish by the sword. Remember Jesus Christ, the Prince of Peace, who said, blessed are the peacemakers. We now move into the act of remembrance, and I would invite, if you're able, those to stand. Let us stand together.
Roll call of those who died in the war. Or War, 1899 to 1902. Roland Dennis Taylor, Alfred Riggs. World War I, 1914 to 1918. Gordon A. Ferguson, W.L. Harvey, Gordon T. Hazard, Thomas W. Hooper, Frank Major Hughes, William King, C. Spurgeon McKenzie, T. Kyler McKenzie, J. P. Moore, G. H. Stanley, Arnold Taylor, James Taylor. World War II, 1939 to 1945. Prentice B. Andrew, Lowell M. Braho, B. Claire Champion, William F. Collings, Robert, D Robert L. Cox, Robert F. Dickey, Edgar J. Dockendorf, Gerald G. Ferguson, Alfred E. Ford, William A. Johnston, Arthur M. Jones, A. Boyce McKee, R. Bruce McNeil, Daniel J. Nicholson, H. Frederick Seaman, Lloyd W. Smith, F. Campbell Stewart, Ernest A. Tredenick, Korean War, 1953, Elliot McKay. They shall not grow old as we that are left grow old.
please join me in the prayer in the uh, yellow, uh, the yellow, yellow colored hearts. Let us pray. Let us pray for all who suffer as a result of conflict and ask that God may give us peace. For the servicemen and women who have died in the violence of war, each one remembered by and known to God, may God give peace. For those who love them in death as in life, offering the distress of our grief and the sadness of our loss, may God give peace. For all members of the armed forces who are in danger this day, remembering family, friends, and all who pray for their safe return, may God give peace. God give peace. For civilian women, children, and men whose lives are disfigured by war or terror, calling to mind the impenitence, the anger, and hatreds of humanity, may God give peace. For peacemakers and peacekeepers who seek to keep this world secure and free, may God give peace. God give peace. For all who bear the burden and privilege of leadership, political, military, and religious, asking for gifts of wisdom and resolve in the search for reconciliation and peace, may God give peace. And together, O God of truth and justice, who hold before you those whose memory we cherish and those whose names we will never know, help us to lift our eyes above the torment of this broken world and grant us the grace to pray for those who wish us harm. As we honor the past, may we put our faith in your future, for you are the source of life and hope and now and forever. Amen. Our Father, which art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come. Thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, the power and the glory forever and ever. Amen. At this time, if the children would like to, they can certainly stay, but if you'd like to go to Sunday school, you're more than welcome to. I would invite you to stand and join in our hymn, Let There Be Light.
A reading from Exodus 3.15. God also said to Moses, Thus you shall say to the Israelites, The Lord, the God of your ancestors, the God of Abraham, the God of Isaac, and the God of Jacob has sent me to you. This is my name forever, and this my title for all generations. Go and assemble the elders of Israel and say to them, The Lord, the God of your ancestors, the God of Abraham, of Isaac, and of Jacob, has appeared to me, saying, I have given heed to you and to what has been done to you in Egypt. I declare that I will bring you up out of the misery of Egypt to the land of the Canaanites, the Hittites, the Amorites, the Perizzites, the Hivites, and the Jebusites, a land flowing with milk and honey. They will listen to your voice, and you and the elders of Israel shall go to the king of Egypt and say to him, The Lord, the God of the Hebrews, has met with us. Let us now go a three days journey into the wilderness, so that we may sacrifice to the Lord our God. I know, however, that the king of Egypt will not let you go unless compelled by a mighty hand. So I will stretch out my hand and strike Egypt with all my wonders that I will perform in it. After that, he will let you go. I will bring this people into such favor with the Egyptians that when you go, you will not go empty-handed. Each woman shall ask when you go, each woman shall ask her neighbor, and any woman living in the neighbor's house for jewelry of silver, of gold, and of clothing, and you shall put them on your sons and on your daughters, and so you shall plunder the Egyptians.
reading from the Gospel according to Mark, chapter 12, verse 41 to 44. The widow's offering. He sat down opposite the treasury and watched the crowd putting money into the treasury. Many rich people put in large sums. A poor widow came and put in two small copper coins, which are worth a penny. Then she called, then he called his disciples and said to them, Truly, I tell you, this poor widow has put in more than all of those who are contributing to the treasury, for all of them have contributed out of their abundance. But she, out of her poverty, has put in everything she had, all she had to live on. Good morning. Good morning. I'm thank Reverend Moses and Reverend David for asking me to come today to speak about the nursing sisters of World War I. Can you hear me now? The title of my message today is Courage and Caring in the Face of Peril. And I think as you hear some of the stories, you'll realize that these nurses were courageous and caring and were always in peril. I'm just going to step aside for a moment. They didn't have these problems in World War I. <laughs> you just had to do a lot of yelling. Um, so obviously they weren't slogging through the fields of Flanders in a uniform like this. So the other uniform that you see in the monitor uh, on the right, in the middle and on the right, was the uniform that they wore in the wars. And it was a long uniform, blue uniform covered with a white bib and apron. Now, 100 years ago, in October of 1914, the first Prince Edward Island nurse went to war. She was Lieutenant Nursing Sister Rena McLean of Surrey. She crossed the North Atlantic to the battlefields of Europe, and it was a war that left her in a watery grave off the coast of Ireland. During the course of the war, at least another 114 island nurses followed her to those battlefields. You may ask, why did so many island nurses go off to a foreign war? And the more I researched them, the more I realized that you couldn't have kept them home. They joined for several reasons. One, they felt it was their duty as a nurse. It was their patriotic duty. And some of them, it was their Christian duty. But most of all, they knew that they had something that was intrinsically different, that was special, and was unique, and that was caring and compassion. They were the counterpoint to the horrors of war. They would sit with their lads, as they called them, and listen to the sad, sad stories, and comfort them, and yes, at times, sat and cried along with them, with the men. Um, this is a map that shows you the northeast coast of France and where you see all these red dots, uh, these were Canadian hospitals. So these aren't all the Canadian hospitals, there were some further down as well, but the majority of them were around this area and there was a reason for this. You see there along the coast they had to evacuate patients to England and also those hospitals were very near the battlefields. Um, Practically all these nurses who served in France were near the battlefields, and at times 
subject to bombings and artillery fire. In England, again, the Canadian hospitals were sort of along the southern coast. And again, that was because when they evacuated them from France, these were the closest areas. Up near, further up the map, you're going to see Liverpool. And this is the area where the hospital ships left for Halifax. And many of the, of the island nurses were on hospital transport. Uh, Rena McLean, who I alluded to before, was in hospital transport, and she was killed when the ship she was on was sunk by a German submarine. was torpedoed. Now, at least three island nurses also served in the Mediterranean. Um, and I suspect when these nurses went off to war, they thought, yes, I'd be serving in France and England, maybe Belgium, but probably not in their wildest imagination did they think that they would be in Malta and Egypt and Palestine and Macedonia and Limas and Russia and um, Poland and Germany. They were in more areas of conflict than the men were. And the reason they were in the Mediterranean is because in 1915, when the Gallipoli campaign was on, the um, director of medical services for the British Army asked Canada to send five, five hospital units to the Mediterranean. He said, I have nine divisions in Salonika. That was about 160-some thousand men. And he said, no nurses. And if you know anything about the Gallipoli campaign, it was a fiasco. Half of the people there, half the 500,000 were casualties. So the nurses went there. Now, because we're in a Methodist church, or it was a Methodist church at the time of the First World War, I thought you might like to know about some of the women from this church. And there were four that I know of. Um, Ellen Beatrice Seaman, she went by Nellie, daughter of Joseph Seaman and Ellen Norton. Now, Joseph Seaman has been as stated as being a Methodist preacher, but we know him best as the principal of the Prince Street School. Ellen Norton was from Roseneath. Her father, John Norton, went off to the California Gold Rush in 1849, so maybe she would get her spirit of adventure from her father. Uh, another nurse from this congregation, Winifred Dobson Skierman, daughter David Skierman and Amy Dobson. The Dobson name runs deeply in this church. Um, one was a Methodist minister. Um, another, Belle Vaughan, I know very little about her uh, her father was listed as being a teamster, but the family seemed to move from PEI about 100 years ago. And Florence Much, the daughter of Henry Much, and Margaret Moore. Margaret can trace her roots back to Benjamin Chapel, who was the founder of the Methodist Church in PEI. Um, he, her father, also went in the Brig Fanny, so they came from adventurous fathers. So Nellie Seaman was one of the nurses who went to the Mediterranean in 1915. She was um, sent by the Red Cross of Windsor, Nova Scotia for a year. And she seemed to be based in Egypt, but was on a hospital ship that went to Palestine and uh, Salonika and Limas, um, all around the Mediterranean. And what is fairly significant, she was in peril at all this time, because in 1915, the Germans had declared unrestricted submarine warfare, and they were, they were sinking hospital ships. So um, Nellie spent her year there. It's interesting, uh, when she first got there, you could see the spirit of adventure. She wrote home to her family and said, tell the boys, those two brothers, to hurry up and get in the war. Or it's soon going to be over. Of course, we know that wasn't the case. She said, um, supplies needed, patients numerous and badly smashed up. Uh, nurses couldn't really tell what was going on. They had to speak in code. But it was a terrible, terrible place to be. So Nellie finished, and you'd think, oh, I've spent a year. Um, I've done my bit, but no. She came back to PEI, and she joined the Canadian Army Medical Corps, and she went to France again. Um, and spent a good part of the time until 1919 
in France and England. And she was in hospitals that were being bombed in 1918. Um, and the war was over, of course, we know, in November. But the nurses, most of them didn't get home to the summer or the fall of 1919 because there were still lots of sick people in, in Europe. So she got transferred to uh, Wales. Now, we think might be a safe spot to be in March of 1919, but she was there for the demobilization riots. And in March, the uh, soldiers had been on half pay, on half, ra no, no pay, half rations. Uh, they had no place to sleep, some of them, and conditions were very, very bad. And they wanted to get home. The war had been over for four months, so they rioted. And so she was in the thick of one of the hospitals that, where the riots were. Now, the, the riot resulted in five soldiers being killed, 23 wounded, 78 arrested, 25 convicted of mutiny, and they were given from 90 to uh, 10 years for, for mutiny, which is, I think, really ironic when the war is over. So after the war, Nellie came back to Canada. She joined the VON in Montreal. She was a supervisor of a hospital in Glace Bay. She retired back to Charlottetown and lived in Upper Prince Street at the Balmoral Apartments and died in Charlottetown and is buried in Charlottetown. Another nursing sister from this congregation, although Summerside claims her as well because she was born there, um, is Winifred Dobson Skierman. And as I said, the Dobson name runs deeply in the Methodist Church here. She, her mother died in childbirth, and um, Winnie was brought up by Maid Nance. And these are two of the places that she lived in Summerside. She was, um, uh, Captain Allen owned these places. Uh, Fernwood on the right was also the home of W.H. Pope, who was the uh, father of Confederation. And his daughter, Georgina Pope, was the first matron of the Canadian Army Medical Corps. So Winnie had a voyage of a lifetime. And I'm not going into great detail. It's, it's in the book. But she was on a hospital ship in 1917, going to England and on to France. It was uh, um, they were gearing up for the Battle of Passchendaele. Hospital ships were clearly marked. They were painted white. They had big red crosses, and they had a green stripe around the sh top of the ship, and I don't know the proper name for that. Um, and at night, they were lit. They didn't go in convoys. They could go much faster than a convoy could. And it was a contravention of the Articles of War for anybody to attack a hospital ship. So when he was on her way to war and somewhere in the North Atlantic, um, all of a sudden, they said, we've just spotted a sub. And they all clambered to the deck. And they were boarded. You see the boarding party here. And uh, for an hour and a half, they were interrogated and searched. And when he said, that hour and a half, the nerve strain was awful. I'd say that was an understatement. And then she said, nobody panicked. Nobody fainted or anything. At the end of that, they had a church service. And I guess probably thank God that they were still alive. Winnie um, served uh, some time in England and went to France to a hospital that Canada had established to treat the French soldiers and the French um, citizens. And she was nursing during the Spanish flu epidemic. And it was, it was a terrible time. The hospitals had far more patients than they had room for. So it was um, a very difficult time for the nurses. She succumbed to the flu as well, and, but did recover. And she was decorated by the French president. And I'm not going to try in my terrible French to say what award she got. After the war, Winnie did all sorts of things. And I'm, I know from talking to the relatives, she, would, she had a great spirit of adventure. They said it was an adventure to go in a car with her. She had a little... Um, green Volkswagen Beetle, and they said a drive around Summerside with Winnie was an adventure. She was totally oblivious to speed limits and stop signs. <laughs> so after the war, she came back, and she tried hairdressing for a while. 
she was a matron of a hospital in Nova Scotia. She worked in Cleveland and New York and Boston. And in the 1930s, she and her cousin decided they'd go to England and learn how to be chiropodists. And they set up, came back and set up a practice in Charlottetown. Um, and she was the night supervisor of the provincial sanatorium and retired to Summerside. But in the spirit of adventure, she was in England and uh, took in the uh, coronation of George V and also went on the Vimy pilgrimage. And you see a picture of her looking up into the eyes of Edward VIII, dangerous person to look at eyes. Um, then we have Lieutenant Nursing Sister Florence Much, again, who had, as I said, deep roots in this congregation. She was another who went over as a reinforcement for the Battle of Passchendaele. She was in number two Canadian Stationary Hospital in France, which was the first Canadian hospital established, and Rena McLean was one of the nurses there. And Georgina Pope of Summerside was the matron. There were other islanders there at the time, Eleanor McLaren Gordon of Brudenell and Laura Gordon of Cascompec. Here you see the nurses' residence. Now this looks rather grand. Um, most of the time it wasn't grand. They were in tents somewhere and they were cold and wet and accommodations were not great. Now Florence became a casualty of the war. I don't mean she died, but she became ill. Um, she was sick several times and invalided to England but felt guilty, thought she should be back in France. And it was a pattern with these nurses. They worked and worked and worked too long when they were sick and then just couldn't go on anymore. This is the ship she went to England in, a hospital ship. Now, just to show you what kind of toll the war took on the physical and mental health of these women, this is in 1918. Some of them had been in battlefields for four years. We have Matron Georgina Pope. By August, of, uh, by July of 1918, this is after the German offensive. This is after their hospitals had been bombed for four or five months uh, and they were all overworked. She suffered shell shock. She was invalided back to England and back to Canada and invalided out of the army in March of 1919 as unfit for service. She was the longest serving member of the Canadian Army Medical Corps, of uh, the nurse, and um, was, the, was the matron. Eleanor McLaren Gordon, also at that hospital at the same time, by August of 1918 was invalided to England. She was shell-shocked. She seemed to recover after three months or so uh, married a medical officer, settled in the U.S., and died of childbirth in 1922. Mary Florence Much, who we were just speaking about, was invalided to England with mental and physical debility in the summer of 1918. She married a doctor and died in 1925 of goiter and question mark TB. You wonder just how um, stressed these women's bodies were. And then there was Laura Gordon, who was in the same hospital at the same time. She was from Cascombeck. And in 1918, in the summer, she was hospitalized with sciatica, back pain, leg pain. What's really significant here, they had all just come through the German offensive, and they were overworked, they were tired, and they didn't collapse till it was over. Then we have Belle Vaughan of uh, Charlottetown. Uh, some of you know this family, I would love to know. Um, she went to California, uh, first worked as a telephone operator, graduated in nursing, um, and just at the beginning of the war, uh, came back to Winnipeg because her brother was sick. So she enlisted in Winnipeg, and again, she went over at the time for the Battle of Passchendaele, and she was in these hospitals that were being bombed, and one, number seven, at a tab. Uh, you see the nurses, she's probably in that picture, but I don't know which one she is. This gives you a bit of a, uh, an idea what the hospitals looked like. If you think it was one building, it wasn't. There were huts and round tents and square tents and long tents, hundreds and hundreds of tents. This hospital held a thousand patients, and when in the thick of battle, it would often go up to 2,000, and there would be no more nurses. They would just have to cope. 
Here's a ward in a hut. You see how crowded it was. Very difficult for the nurses to give care. And you'll see patients up the center aisle. So the hospital was overcrowded. This is a picture of the bombing at Etab in, in May of 1918. This, is, this was the nurses' residence. And um, it took a direct hit. Three of the nurses, it was at night, and three were killed, three were wounded. And this was just in one bombing. So Belle came home in 1919 on the Adriatic. And after the war, she returned to Winnipeg, and she married and died in Victoria in 1974. So they were full-blooded and complex women living in a, in a tumultuous time in history, doing their duty in distant battlefields, always in peril, every, ever dutiful, and always courageous. Here you see um, pictures that, taken by a nurse, actually. This is Ypres in 1918, early 1919. Uh, St. Martin's Cathedral, which was badly bombed, and you see a picture of Vimy Ridge. So I hope now you may have a greater appreciation of the nurses who were overseas in World War I. These are just a few of the stories. There are 115 absolutely amazing stories with these women. So thank you very much. Thank you, Catherine, for your sharing with us this morning and for your gift of writing and research and bringing to light uh, the women uh, that uh, certainly worked and uh, worked very hard uh, during World War I and certainly provided care and leadership, uh, unsung heroes and the many uh, that you have recognized. I'm sure there are many, many others who are not recognized, and I think that's how history usually treats women, <laughs> unfortunately. So thank you for your work, and thank you for the, the wonderful research that you've done, and thank you for sharing with us this morning. I'd invite you to stand if you're able and to join in our next hymn, Abide With Me. Thank you.
Stewardship is not, does not put God into a box labeled church on Sunday. Stewardship brings God to every part of our daily life and speaks out against oppression wherever it is found. Your morning offering will now be received. We give as we are able, as we have been called. Our hymn, Give Thanks for Life, the Measure of Our Days, Mortal We Pass Through.
And now may the blessing of God go before you. May God's grace and peace abound. Amen. Thank <laughs> you.